Good evening and welcome to El Oso Fumar Takes. This is our 63rd take live from Euless, Texas. I'm your host as always, Bear Duplissy, and I'm so excited to uh, welcome everyone in tonight. It's going to be a fantastic, amazing show. I've heard a, a lot of y'all have been reaching out to me, asking me about the show this week, and I'm so excited to uh, bring in our guests who I'll introduce in just a moment. Uh, before that, I really wanted to thank all of you guys for all your likes, shares, comments, and continued support. And always remember that we are available on our YouTube channel. You can subscribe and like, as well as now we are available on iTunes and Google Play. So check us out, download, like, subscribe, and of course, leave a review. Uh, this show is sponsored by Drew Estate. Drew, Jonathan Drew and Marvin Smell are not your average cigar makers. Their story does not start in Cuba or with fathers in the cigar business like our guest tonight. It started with the dream and through their can-do spirits and never-say-die attitude made Drew Estate one of the premier cigar manufacturers on the planet. The Drew Estate story is one of daring heartbreak and success, but most of all, one of passion for cigars in the country of Nicaragua, where they've been making cigars since 1998. Cigars like their one of their latest brands, the Herrera Esteli by Drew Estate. Herrera Esteli, Brazili uh, Herrera Esteli Brazilian Maduro, Features a dense plantation-grown Montefina wrapper over a Connecticut River Valley broadleaf binder and fillers from Nicaragua. Manufactured at Drew Estate, the Herrera Esteli Brazilian Maduro was blended by Willie Herrera and is presented in five terrific batolas. And without further ado, I would like to welcome our guest this evening. This is a really exciting episode for me, and I hope you guys get a lot of enjoyment out of it as well. I am so pleased to welcome in... Tony Gomez of La Florida Minicana. Tony, how you doing tonight? I'm doing all right, Bear. Uh, glad to be here, man. Thanks for having me. Really Absolutely. It. Absolutely, man. It's it's my pleasure. I'm I'm supposed to uh, I'm supposed to ask you about the Patriots um, from your from your vice president of sales, John Carney. Um, but I don't want the show to end prematurely. So I mean, you yeah. can feel free to answer if you want. <laughs> yeah. Listen, I'm. I'm I'm sick of it. I'm sick of it, man. That's just, that's just why can't they stop? I hate it, Carney. I'm not congratulating you for shit, man. <laughs> <laughs> I'm done. It's uh, I I remember this story that John told me uh when we did the uh big game show last year. Uh, he does it with uh, Coop every year, and I was fortunate enough to join him last year. I'm going to be doing this again. He was telling us the story about he was in an airport one time, and he's wearing his Patriots hat and his like Alabama pullover, <laughs> and a guy just like bumps into him, like accidentally, kind of looks at him, looks him up and down. And John's a big guy, but looks at it where he's wearing mostly, and he's like, "Oh, I just bet you're insufferable." <laughs> <laughs> oh god! Can you believe it? That's that's the the most obnoxious combination of fans I've ever heard of in my life. Well, you know what? He has a saving grace, though, Tony. He's not a Yankees fan, so it's all good. Uh, <laughs> Jesus. So, we we're really really excited to have you uh, on this evening, uh, Tony. It's 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 truly a pleasure of mine. For those uh, who follow the show and uh, who those who know me uh, know I've 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 uh, La Florida Minicon is responsible. Uh, for me, even being here, uh, um, which is a which is a story into itself, with uh, one of your older reps who's now retired, uh, Jack Sandlin, who used to work for you guys a long time the ago. Great Jack Sandlin, yeah. the great Jack Sandlin, the Silver Fox. Uh, yeah. He's the he is the reason I am here today, and uh, uh, and even then he he still tried he refuses to take credit for that. But uh, <laughs> but La Florida Minicana is is central and paramount to my story in the premium cigar industry and and how right. it, it came to be. But uh, but again, so this is a this is a truly special show for me. But oh, the reason I asked you to come on is I have so I'm so interested in, from so many different perspectives uh, of how you know you fit into the premium cigar industry. Um, obviously, your father is Lito Gomez. That's that should go without saying. But we do have people that may live under a rock, so I just want to go ahead and you know address the elephant in the room uh your dad starts a brand in the mid 90s during the cigar boom okay so this is something that just before it actually just, just before, before that's right yeah the just before the official but it was it was it was the coming you know it was coming up through mm -hmm. that time and uh you and i are roughly the same age you're younger than i am but you know we didn't get to experience that firsthand uh in the sense of as cigar smokers sure um, but you know, it was, it was a crazy time and everything and people were doing crazy things, different weird brands that I mean, and 
you know, innovation was just crazy going out there and your, your father and La Florida Minicon gave prominence to the Lajero leaf um, in history and, and thus changed, I think the course of the cigar industry as a whole forever and everything. But kind of fast forward a little bit, but still keeping it in the past. What was it like growing up? See, your father did not grow up in the cigar industry, mm -hmm. but you did. So what what was different from your your childhood as compared to maybe other colleagues that did that were that are third and fourth and fifth generation? Sure. Um, you know, to, to be honest, in, in some ways, I, I suppose there's a lot of, you know, um, like you said, colleagues that um, maybe were destined to do this from birth. You know, it's it's you know their father did it, their grandfather, and so on and so forth. And it was maybe just kind of assumed that you know that's that's what you're gonna do uh, at some point in your life. Where to be honest, I I never I didn't know I was gonna be in the cigar business. You know, it, it definitely wasn't a sure thing, and I really didn't even. For those of you, uh, those of you tuning in, I think we have a little bit of technical difficulties here. So stand by for a moment uh, as I try to get our guests back in. Uh, just give us a brief moment. Again, do appreciate your patience as we're experiencing some technical difficulties here. Let me go ahead and uh, see what we can do. So uh, bear with me momentarily. We're speaking with Tony Gomez of La Florida Minicana Cigars. Uh, and we will be right with you just a brief moment as we uh, try to get us reconnected here. So what I had asked Tony was, uh, and he, as he was starting to explain was the fact that he was, uh, he grew up in the cigar industry, but he is not, um, like many of his colleagues in the business, a third or fourth generation, uh, you know, fourth generation in this particular business. His father, Lido actually, um, was, uh, had another profession before he got into the cigar business. And, um, uh, something else we'll discuss also is where, there is a lot of Cuban heritage prominence in this industry. And uh, that is something that the Gomez family does not have, uh, you know, necessarily. So there's so many different things about this family that has now brought this com this company of La Florida Minicana to prominence. Uh, and it's been, it's been absolutely terrific for them. Uh, they've, they've done some great things over the last 20 years. And now Tony is stepping into a role with the company and I wanted to get him on to specifically talk about some of those things. So again, bear with us as we try to, uh, get these technical difficulties straightened out. Uh, we're going to try to get reconnected with Tony here briefly, and we really, really appreciate you guys standing by. So bear with us. Um, and we will, uh, we'll get, uh, we'll get our guest, uh, back online here in just a second. Um, Again, bear with us as we're trying to get reconnected here. Uh, so thank you so much for your patience as we're dealing with some technical difficulties. Um, and I really appreciate everyone tuning in for this. So um, bear with us just a little bit longer. We are working through it and uh, Tony's on it. So it looks like we are, are getting something figured out here. So uh, again, thank you so much for your patience. Really, really appreciate it here. Uh, looks like uh, Tony's getting back logged in, and uh, we're going to get on this here in just a second. So, um, just trying to get back in here a little bit. Um,
again, we really appreciate your patience here. We are uh, trying to uh, get this straightened out. Um, do appreciate you guys still sticking with us here. Um, it is something that we should be able to fix here just momentarily as we try to get Tony logged back in here uh, to the call. So again, thank you so much for tuning and standing by. Um, again, we're, we're having a conversation with Tony Gomez of La Florida Minicana. And it uh, looks like he just got back in here. Again, really appreciate your patience uh, with the technical difficulties. And it's Sorry fantastic. About that. Oh, no worries, Tony. No worries at all. So um, you, were, you, were, uh, you were actually just starting to tell us, you know, what it was like um, growing up in this industry um, yeah. where some of your colleagues have uh, had a few generations uh, of experience ahead of them. Sure. Yeah, like I said, like it, it wasn't a given thing, you know. Um, there, there was no our destiny kind of written for me. Obviously, you know, my my father started the company when I was seven, um, and then, as you can imagine, back back in those days, very different industry to what it is today. Um, back in those days, starting a cigar company, especially you know, opening a factory and all that, was was actually it was it was a rather crazy idea, you know. Um, there was an industry controlled by families of multiple generations, and there, there really weren't a lot of newcomers. It was really the boom that kind of started bringing that in, but um, back in those days, it was, it was not a normal thing. So, um, obviously, <laughs> I don't think anybody knew that this was going to last 25 years. It certainly wasn't a, a, a given thing. Um, this was very much an experiment. Um, and luckily, obviously, it worked out. But yeah, like I said, I, I didn't know I was going to be a part of this. Um, I think it was really around my last year of college that I really, really started to think about it. Um, and, you know, I, I kind of had other plans in my head. But, you know, I got to thinking that uh, opportunities like this just don't appear out of nowhere. And uh, I would be a fool to not at least give it a shot, you know. So, so I did. And, uh, you know, my dad never put pressure on me either. It was, um, he was always, uh, he was always very adamant about, he wants me to do whatever makes me happy. You know, if, uh, if it was something other than cigars and he would support me, but if I wanted to, he always, uh, he always let me know that he had a job waiting for me, you know? That's terrific. That's so let's, let's go back a little bit. Um, let's go back 15 years if we can. Sure. So, um, what does, I'm trying to do the math in my head here. Uh, what does uh, what does uh, 16, 17 year, 18 year old Tony Gomez want to do with his life? Be a rock star, <laughs> move to California, live in a van, and, <laughs> and play music. <laughs> uh, that age, I was I was um, I was playing a lot of music. I, I played bass and drums, and um, always trying to get bands together and all that kind of stuff. So that was kind of my uh, that was kind of my dream at the time. Uh, it didn't quite work out, but that's all right. <laughs> but yeah. Well, I think some would argue that you are a, a rock star of a different caliber per, per se. Um, it, it, you still have fans you, <laughs> and, and your transportation is a little bit cooler than a van though. Right. I mean, they give you nice rental cars at the airport. It's a little nicer. Yeah. Um, the, uh, yeah, it, it's a different world, and it's it's cool, man. You know, it's it's just the simple fact that this show even exists. Um, it makes me very happy, man. It means that uh, that people just really love cigars, and the fact that they're interested enough to you know sit at home and and watch this podcast or you know listen to it later, whatever it might be. Uh, I think that that is awesome, and that's a, that's a great sign for the industry. Um, and I appreciate people like you that try to um, you know. Um, take people that, that like cigars and create people that really love cigars and, and kind of, you know, continue pushing the culture and, and, uh, and being a part of it in, in the way you saw fit, you know? So I think this is awesome. I really do. That's very humbling, Tony. Thank you. Um, what I, what I, next thing, next thing I wanted to kind of talk to you about was, you know, as you were starting in the company and everything, where did you start exactly? Um, you know, because I mean, we are talking. I guess I guess you're you're right about ten years in the business now. So where did yeah. you start um, when you day one when you're like, hey, dad, you know, dad, where, I want to go ahead and start and get into the business. Where where did you actually start with the company? Uh, I hit the road as a sales rep. I was um, I was a sales rep for almost four years. 
I covered all of Florida. And uh, funny enough, I, I had, uh, if anybody's got a weirder territory, I would like to hear it, but I, I covered Florida and Colorado. That was, that was my territory. <laughs> uh, I, don't, I have yet to hear of a weirder one. <laughs> Uh, so that's what I did, man. I, I, I hit the road and um, I had about 200, maybe 210 uh, accounts. And uh, and that was kind of the beginning of it. Um, learned the hell of a lot. had a lot of fun. Plenty of stories from those days, uh, many of which I won't tell on the show. But uh, <laughs> <laughs> it was a great experience, man. And it was very valuable. And I learned a lot that helped me later on, you know, when I got into the manufacturing side and maybe, you know, got into the uh, product development side and knowing what, what people like and, you know, what we should be trying to do, uh, maybe a little differently than what we're currently doing. Um, so it gave me a lot of perspective on, on you know, just what's going on in the shops, you know. You know, you hear a lot about people doing different roles within the business uh, before they kind of end up in the role that they're meant to be in. Um, Ha I will ask you the question this way, Tony. Are you in the position you're meant to be in, or is there or is there possibly something different on the horizon for you? Um, as, as far as cigars go in La Puerto Dominicana, um, no, this is this is the position, you know. Um, uh, I have a lot of roles at the company at this point, much like my father and much like um, you know my stepmother Ines. We wear a lot of hats. It's um, very much still a family business. It's uh, it's not a big company. It's much smaller than people think that we are. Uh, we like that. There's there's a certain kind of perception that we're bigger than what we actually are, uh, and that's a good thing. And uh, but yeah, you know, uh, I'm kind of all over the place, and and I enjoy that. You know, so from factory to the sales to marketing to product development, kind of have a, a hand in a little bit of everything. We'll get back to your story in just a moment. But uh, speaking of the size of, of La Florida Dominicana, you guys are actually just uh, completed or are completing uh, an addition to your factory, correct? Uh, we 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 did a we did an expansion. We we didn't build anything, but um, we made better use of the space that we have at the factory. We knocked down a wall, expanded the rolling room. Um, but we were able to do it without actually building anything, you know, it's just, uh, making more efficient use of, of the space that we had. So, um, we've added about, uh, 10 pairs of rollers so far. We'll add another, uh, five, six, seven or so, uh, throughout this year, hopefully. And, um, then our factory will be pretty near capacity. Um, my father says he doesn't want to expand any more than that. I wouldn't be surprised if that was not the first time he said that. So we'll see. But um, for now, I, we're we're going to reach a we're going to reach a very com comfortable position. Um, the thing is, you know, we're 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 not a big company. We we consider ourselves a boutique, you know, at least a boutique style manufacturer. And there's obviously a point where you grow, you kind of maybe grow past that. And so we we want a factory that we can still run, you know. Um, uh, so, you know, we, we don't see it growing into a, a giant monster ever. Um, but obviously time will tell, we'll, we'll see how it goes. I remember actually having that discussion with a friend of mine recently about La Florida Minicana and I, how I, I, I used, I used the word boutique to, to describe you guys and, uh, at the company as a whole. And, and he just couldn't believe that. He's like, no, they're, they're everywhere. They're incredibly popular. I was like, I was like, yeah, but you're also talking about two decades of history uh, and hard work that it got, you know, that it took to get that point. But the their manufacturing capacity is still their manufacturing capacity. They're not, you know, they're not rolling 25 million cigars a year. I mean, this is still very much a, a smaller operation. Do you, from your perspective, do you like that it's, I mean, you obviously like that it's a family business, but do you like that it's it's more smaller and controlled? And what kind of flexibility do do you like about that? Absolutely. I, I, I do like it. I do like it. Um, uh, obviously, you know, everybody, you know, has different structure, different folks. And, you know, I see some factories, and there's some massive, massive factories out there. And it's hard for me to imagine, you know, running a place like that. It would take somebody much more skilled than I am at, at uh, administrating things to run. Um, 
But, you know, I like the fact that, you know, obviously, you know, you're a smaller company, you can, you can pivot very quickly, you can, you can make things happen very quickly, um, you can change things very quickly. And so I think that's a huge advantage. And just, you know, just a simple fact that you, you know everything going on in the factory. You know, if, if we were making 30 million cigars a year, then it's, it's a little more difficult to know everything that's going on. And you, you need a lot more help to make that happen. Um, which means you need to find a lot of people you can trust, which is not always easy, you know? Um, but I, I like, I like our size. I like the philosophy and they both coincide pretty well, you know? Absolutely. I totally, like uh, totally agree. So again, we're, we're kind of keeping things in the, a little bit in the past tonight. Um, there's a lot of things about, um, your story that I'm really interested in. We talked about this a little bit before the show. And so I kind of wanted to see what the story of chapter one was like, you know, this is, this is kind of, this is kind of your coming out party a little bit. And, but like when you were first starting that project and getting to getting your hands involved with it, like how did it develop and where did you ultimately see it going? And then what did the result tell you? Sure. Um, well, chapter one started with just, um, just box pressing a normal chisel. So just a double arrow chisel, box press it, just see how it would look. Um, that looked kind of cool, but uh, with a 54 ring gauge, the, the, the taper wasn't all that noticeable. Um, so decided to kick it up a notch into a 58. That way the figure would show a little more, uh, the taper on the chisel. And um, that's how it started. And then it was just a double arrow blend and, and then you know, I, I just started messing around with chapter one was really because I, I started maybe a couple months after I moved down to DR and really started working at the factory. And um, so it was kind of an awesome way to really learn a lot. It was a chapter one was a, was a big learning experience for me. Um, just it helped me kind of really go through all the processes of um of the factory, you know, from, you know, which picking out the tobaccos, trying them, getting to know them very well, creating a blend, um, deciding on the shape, deciding on a box, uh, the branding, the ring, everything, working with the box manufacturer, working with the ring manufacturer. Um, and you know, my, my, my father has never been the type of person that holds your hand. He's very much a, just a go and do it, you know, uh, figure it out. And obviously if you need any help, you know, I'm here, but, um, so it, it was it was very much a learning experience for me, and um, so so yeah, like I said, I stopped, started with a box press chisel, and then I didn't know what to do with it, and so I decided, you know what, maybe let's just try to create a blend. You know, I'll just give it a shot and see uh, how it comes out. It, a lot of times, blending I've learned and from the beginning and still to this day is it's just experimentation. You know, you're throwing things up against the wall. Uh, some of it sticks, some of it doesn't. Some blends happen very easily, some don't. Uh, you might have a general idea as to what you're going for, but uh, it's always experimentation and it's just having fun, you know? So you're, you're trying things out um, and, and seeing, seeing what works, man, seeing if you can make some magic happen. So that, that's what it was, started messing around, playing with tobaccos, different blends, uh, till I got one that I thought I really liked. And, um, so when I when I thought the cigar was ready, I uh, I remember going out to dinner with uh, with my old man, and uh, you know I lit up a chapter one, which it wasn't I didn't know it was going to be called that at the time, but I lit up the cigar and I passed it to him, and uh, he took a few puffs on it, and uh, you know I was kind of waiting for him to give it back to me, and he just looked at me, he's like, oh what what are you going to smoke? <laughs> <laughs> And that, that's when I knew, okay, fire. So it's probably a good blend at this point. So I, I was happy with that reaction. And then so um, I had an idea for the box. And uh, I told the box maker what I wanted. And so he came back, you know, a couple of days later with a sample, just, you know, raw wood sample. And he gave me the box with the box. Instead of opening like this, like that, like I wanted, it opened like that, right? So I told him, no. It's open like this. I want it to open like that. And so then he, he went back and he brought it to me the next day and he brings it to me and he goes, see, okay, there you go. Now it opens like that, like you wanted, like a book, right? And it was at that second that, dude, chapter one just popped into my head, you know, and it all, it all tied in together perfectly because 
you know, I, I actually, I was an English major in college. I was, uh, I was a writing major. And um, like I originally thought I was gonna go to film school and study screenwriting before I got into this whole cigar thing. Um, so, you know, because I was an English major and it was my first attempt at creating something. Just chapter one was perfect, man. You know, it was, it was, it all came together. And just in that instant, you know, had he not said that, I, I would have never thought of it, you know? So wait a second, rock star, <laughs> budding <laughs> film star. Yeah, very ambitious. <laughs> I mean, man, you, you, uh, Small minded will never be anything near to what you can describe as Tony Gomez. <laughs> I'm going to be a rock star or a film star, and uh, and now I make uh, I make kick ass cigars for a living. So it's uh, <laughs> um, you know that that's it's it's really those little things in life, those moments that get captured sometimes that that really can can alter the you know alter things you know in. You know, for you, it was it was it was a, a one of your uh, one of your box manufacturers uh, just simply uttering a phrase. I mean, and it makes sense, right? It's logical, like yeah. a book. Here you go. Um, so f to that point, like, okay, so you've got you've got this plan. The old man's on board. Box, you got the name. Where did you see it going, and where do you think it actually ended up? Now, obviously, you're still producing the cigar. Um, yeah. And it's still very much regular production uh, to every, you know, uh, to mine included, everyone's satisfaction. But uh, where does Tony Gomez see this? Um, well, it, you know, it was, I, I had faith in it. I definitely had a lot of confidence. I, I loved the cigar and I, I thought it looked cool. I thought the packaging was cool. And I remember, um, I remember putting a picture of it up on our Instagram page uh, before the trade show. And it actually, I, I think at the time it was like the highest liked and commented picture that we ever, that I ever put up there. So, like, oh, I guess uh, it resonated with people, you know, even though, the, you know, nobody had smoked it yet. Nobody had any idea really what it was or what it meant. Uh, but at least people thought it looked cool. So, <laughs> <laughs> so that always helps. Um, I think the day people, you know, people shop with their eyes and I think if, if it looks cool, then then you're probably gonna be more willing to give it a shot. Um, so I I thought it would do well, and uh, it turned out you know it, it was immediately one of our best selling cigars, and really still continues to this day to be one of our top sellers. You know, as well. I mean, it, to me, it's it's so cool to see, man. I remember, I think you know maybe a couple years after the release. I was looking through my notebook, an old notebook that I had, and I, I saw the page where I just drew a real shitty sketch of the box that I wanted, you know? <laughs> and just looking at that, and then I remember, you know, uh, our distributor in Sweden posted a picture with a bunch of chapter ones. They just got a delivery, and you know, it's cool, man. You know, come up with a little idea, and you draw a picture of it in a notebook, and all of a sudden, you know, a couple years later, it's in Sweden, and it's all over the world. And that was, it was just really cool, man. It's really cool to see stuff like that. Yeah, it makes you happy. So was Capitalia Dose the natural follow-up to that, or were you working on other projects and then that just happened to that just happened to come about? No, that that was it was very intentional. Um, kind of immediately got to work on that after after chapter one. Um, after that IBCPR, that was yeah, you know, I, I figured it was a logical next step. So yeah, got to work on that one pretty immediately. That one was a lot more difficult than chapter one. Chapter one actually came, you know, the blend at least came about pretty easily. Uh, Capitulo Dos was a pain in the ass, man. I think it was probably 15, <laughs> 20 blends before, uh, before I finally found one that, that, uh, that I liked. Yeah. So what I'm about to say about the two cigars may sound contradictory, but I want to get your thoughts and I want, and if you don't feel like telling me, that's totally cool. I'm putting you on the spot here. So I have always said that the Capitulo Dos is a more complex cigar out of the two okay but i say that i prefer the chapter one because it's everything that i like about la florida minicana but with something completely different and sure. it's just to me it's just an absolutely solid cigar again complexity not always not not always necessarily makes a cigar better is is always my my punchline to that commentary but do you have a 
Do you have a favorite between the two? Um, yeah, if, if I had, if I had to pick one, uh, I would go chapter one. If I had to pick one, right? Uh, see, I I do enjoy both of them, um, but I I think um, you know I, I see them as you know they're not not brothers, more like cousins maybe. Um, a lot of obviously same size. I think in terms of strength, they're they're pretty similar, but I think uh, they're on pretty opposite ends of the flavor flavor spectrum. Where chapter one's kind of on the the sweeter, more you know maybe chocolatey side, uh, darker flavors. Where capítulo is more on the spicy side. Um, uh, so I I think they're kind of on opposite ends of the flavor spectrum a little bit. Hundred percent. Really that doesn't mean that I'm right or wrong. Everybody's palate is different, man. You know. No, I, I I absolutely agree with you. In terms of actual sales, the Capitulo Dos does edge out the chapter one. So, Interesting. Yeah. Interesting. Yeah. I hundred percent agree with you, and I'm stealing that line, cousins. They're they're not they're not brother and sister, they're cousins. I'm gonna I'm gonna totally steal that. That's that's that that's that's perfect. That's a perfect way to describe it, in my opinion. Uh, very, very apt. So now, now you're really getting involved with a lot of different blends, a lot of different projects. You know, fast forward a few more, a couple more years. You guys get the number one cigar of the year from Cigar Aficionado, the Andalusian Bull. I know you've talked that subject to death, as 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 has John Carney and your father, probably, and anyone associated with the company. So I'm not going to put uh, I'm not going to put my listeners through that uh, through that saga anymore. <laughs> uh, but it is it. I, I could not go to the show without ushering a, another congratulations to that. I mean, it's been a couple of years removed, but that's such a big deal for you guys. Yeah, um, so the, the, I guess the kind of one of the last points I wanted to make tonight, uh, Tony was, so now, and as you described earlier in the interview, you're, you're at the perfect place with this company. You're in the position that you, you're meant to be in. You feel like with La Florida Minicana and the way it's going forward. So we've, We've the Florida Minicana has had a, I would characterize this my words, a brilliant 25 year run, a uh, quarter of a century is nothing to sneeze at. So, what does the next 25 years or even further look like with Tony Gomez in the position that he's in doing the things that he loves to do? <laughs> um. You know, I, I'm not going to say there's going to be any kind of a drastic change. Uh, at least, you know, the, the philosophy will always remain the same at, at La Flor. Um, uh, my father and I, we see completely eye to eye on on who we are and and um, and what we're trying to do here. So, um, obviously, you know, it, I'm I'm an extremely fortunate person, and I, I realize that, and I think about that every day. Um, the fact that, you know, my, my father was able to build something like this because, you know, I always say, man, it doesn't matter what I may or may not have done, created a blend, created a design, a box a ring, whatever. That's the easy stuff that, that is easy. You know, it's just, that's just being creative, having fun. Um, it's, uh, you know, building a cigar factory and, and, uh, and, you know, buying a farm and, and, and growing some of the world's best tobacco, that's hard. That's really difficult. And I, I don't think I could have done any of that, you know? Um, so to me, it's, it's important to, to always remember where we came from and who we are and continue down that path and it, just continue to have fun, man. Um, I, I love to create things and I love to be part of the creative process and, um, I don't think I'll ever get tired of that. Uh, in terms of what's different, well, the, the, the industry, obviously, it's, it's changing. The world is uh, the cigar world, and I'm just talking about the United States. Uh, the cigar world has changed drastically in the last, you know, maybe five, six years. Um, and, uh, and don't take this as where we ever think of abandoning the United States, which obviously we don't. This is always going to be the most important market in the world. But... Uh, the world has opened its mind and uh, its palate to different things. You know, it's not just uh, it's not just that old, you know, little communist country down there running things across the globe anymore. It's uh, Dominican cigars, Nicaraguan cigars. Uh, they're spreading around and people are open to them. People want to try them. 
And we've seen a dramatic shift in, in sales in Europe, you know, China and Australia and all over the world. And that's very exciting. So uh, what's the number two market for LaFleur outside the United States? I'm assuming the United States is number one. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Uh, number two right now is Dominican Republic. Yeah. Interesting. Yeah. Interesting. Yeah. For us. And then you have, you know, uh, Canada's there, Germany's there, um, and then kind of a hodgepodge of different countries around Europe. But yeah, the DR is a solid number two. I've, you know, it's, it's interesting because I hear Germany on a lot of people's, a lot of companies lists. And, uh, you know, I, I had a conversation with uh, Roma Craft Skip Martin about, about Germany specifically. And, and that is true of a num number of companies, but this is how, this is how large the U S sm uh, cigar smoking market is. Uh, and Tony, I just want to get your thoughts on it. Like Germany might be a really large account for you guys, but there are, there are probably states and not big ones. We're not talking about just Texas, but there are probably states that dwarf what you guys do with Germany, correct? There's individual stores that will, door, <laughs> that will beat out Germany, you know? Um, but Germany is tops in Europe. Um, but yeah, obviously the United States, it's, I could be wrong. I don't take this as, as gospel or anything, but I think the United States probably consumes about 50% of the cigars of the entire world, you know? Um, and they probably consume close to something close to that in Cubans, even though they're illegal, you know? Um, so the uh, United States is far and away the biggest market and it always will be. Um, but it's, it's nice to know that there's these new horizons out there and, and that uh, there's new places to be and new, new smokers to, uh, to entice, you know, and to bring over to our side. Outside of outside the United States um, and the and the Dominican Republic, where you call home, you know, yeah. has some of the time. And where, what was the coolest place that you ever smoked a cigar? Huh? I'm putting you on the spot. We didn't talk about this. I really apologize. I just want to know. That's that's a, that's a good question. Um, Coolest place I ever smoked a cigar, man. And if you don't want to say something that find out like this was absolutely the best, if you can just if one that comes to mind. Sure. I I think maybe one of the 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 cigar bars that I have enjoyed the most um would be maybe Bar and Books in Warsaw, Poland. This is just a fantastic like, I, I'm I'm a big sucker for like an old school kind of speakeasy, make a good old fashioned, you know, bartender with white gloves and a, a vest. And they, they just hit all the notes for me. They, it was the perfect little bar. I loved it. Um, that's maybe one of my favorite little cigar bars I've ever been to, I would say. So it's, it's, it's really interesting that, um, you know, you've, you've traveled all over the world. And I've asked that question to several people. And several people, including yourself, have, you know, you know, there. I mean, I'm sure you've smoked some cigars in some grand places and everything, but there's just this one cool spot that meant something to you, yeah. and I think that's indicative of people in this industry that they, it's it's very personal. And so when they find uh, the thing that hits that's that that's right for them, you know, it, right. it's it's not necessarily things really grandiose. It's like, oh, I smoked something at the top of the Eiffel Tower or anything like that. You know, it's it's finding that one spot that's perfect for you. Yeah, absolutely. I think that's what's really great about these, you know, is that, you know, they're best short, you know, they're, they're best when shared with company. Uh, and it doesn't matter necessarily where, where, but, uh, it's the moment in which you have them. So I, I think, uh, I think that's There's probably one of my favorite that. things. There are a few things that, that can bring people together quite like a cigar. It's a special thing, you know, it's, it's a very special thing. And my father's got a great story that, that he always tells that I really love. Um, you know, he's got a story about he was in a cigar lounge. I, I forget where, I think somewhere perhaps around Maryland. And um, he was sitting in the lounge waiting for the owner. The owner of the shop was busy with something. And he was sitting in the lounge checking his emails on his phone. And there was two guys having a conversation. And, uh, you know, one, one of them was noticeably more of a blue collar guy, while the other one had a very fancy suit and a nice watch. Um, and these two guys were just having a great conversation about all sorts of things, politics, sports, whatever. Um, and he said, you know, the guy in the suit stood up 
And he said, hey, well, you know, hey, listen, it was, I got to get going, but it was a pleasure meeting you and thanks for the conversation. And, uh, you know, the other guy goes, hey, uh, it's a pleasure, but, you know, I actually know who you are. Um, I'm one of the guys that, that you know, uh, does your yard work, you know? And uh, it's just so cool because that, that's something that happens in a cigar shop. You know, these two guys maybe would have never hung out if it wasn't for that. But, you know, it, you're in a cigar shop, you're sitting down, you're having a smoke. It doesn't matter, you know, what uh, economically where you might be or where you're from and all those things. You're, everybody's sitting down and, and enjoying a good smoke. And, and it's a beautiful thing, man. It really is a very beautiful thing. And uh, I think... I think politicians and all these people that are uh, <clears throat> trying to get rid of us for inexplicable reasons should really spend some time in a cigar lounge and just see the just the human aspect of it and and how you know, it's just a it's just a people thing and, and and it's just something that adults enjoy doing you know and there's no harm in it whatsoever to anybody. Hundred hundred percent agree. Uh, you know we often joke about. Uh, in our little in our little corners of the world, we often joke about it. We could turn, um, you know, the entirety of uh, U.S. Congress into a giant cigar lounge. Imagine what we could do. What, imagine what we yeah. could accomplish. <laughs> Absolutely, man. Um, Absolutely. We'd be land. We'd be landing on Neptune by now. That's my <laughs> firm belief. So, um, Tony, I can't thank you enough for uh, sitting down with me tonight. And uh, through the a little bit of the technical difficulties and everything, getting back on board, uh, absolutely fantastically, uh, fantastic learning more about your story and uh, how it's uh, La Florida Minicana will be going in the future. And it's certainly, certainly an exciting thing. Um, I do want to leave you with uh, one thing, a um, story that um, I said I was going to tell you af afterwards, but I, I, I don't think I've actually ever recounted it on this show. So first time I met your father. So as I as, as I said in the introduction, uh, uh, man, stories. <laughs> um, so gracious, so gracious of a man. Like um, so, I as I as I mentioned, La Florida Minicana is the reason I got into premium cigars. Uh, that's the central story to it and everything. And so I became uh, when I started really getting into cigars in general. I started researching the people behind, it. and of course, that naturally landed me on, on learning more about Lito Gomez, uh, your father, and. So uh, before I worked for Michael's Tobacco, um, I was a patron. And when I found out we were they were having an event for La Florida Minicana and that Lito Gomez was going to be there, I was like, oh, my gosh, this is my opportunity. I I am so excited. And I was just so thrilled. I had one of my best friends come who knew who knew who he was as well. And my brother came as well. Um, and. I said, you know, that was, you know, back before, you know, smartphones existed and stuff like that. So I had my wife's really awesome digital camera that was like this big now, um, you know, and I was so excited and everything. So I, I run into who you, who's my general manager now, but you know him as well. Tracy Spancy. He's like, Hey, he's here. He knew, cause he knew too. I was, I had told him I was excited. And he's like, he's here. He's in the humidor. Go talk to him. And I was like, I can't go talk to him. He's like, well, what are you going to do? Just, he's like, this is why you came up here, right? And I was like, well, yeah. He's like, just go talk to him. And um, I ended up going into the humidor. Um, and before I said anything, he someone called his attention and he like bumped past me, not like rudely or anything, just like bumped past me. And I was like, uh, kind of <laughs> missed opportunity. And fast forward a little bit, I finally get to talk to him. And, you know, the only thing that can come out of my mouth, of course, is, Mr. Gomez, it's a pleasure meeting you, and I, I, I like your cigars. And, <laughs> and there are certain people that would call me eloquent, and that's what came out of my mouth. And, and it was just, it's a lot worse than I'm actually telling it. Tracy actually loves to recount the story. He, he often refers to me as a, a 12 year old, you know, a 12 year old or a kid in a candy store, but can't have candy and yeah. just, looks at everyone else who's having a great time and is just, you know, miserable because they don't know what to do with themselves. <laughs> but it was, it was an absolute, it was an absolute pleasure meeting him that day. In fact, I actually uh, gave him uh, a printout of a, an old blog entry. He had an old blog a long time ago. Um, that was kind of my first start in media. Um, failed miserably. It was terrible, but I recounted the story about how I got to smoking La Flora cigars and uh, he actually signed a copy of it for me, but he actually, he asked if he could have a copy and I was like, I just happened to have one and he took it. And so, um, 
that that meant a lot to me too. So it's a fantastic. Your father, very gracious man. Uh, I will forever be grateful for that encounter, and it's it's been an absolute pleasure speaking with you today. Uh, really, really exciting to see what Lafleur does in the future. I appreciate it, man. Thank thank you for having me. And again, just thank you, uh, thank you for what you do. Right, you. Uh, this is an important thing to the industry, and and I love to see it, man. I really love seeing this. Good man. Thank you, sir. I very. Very, very humbling words to be coming from you, uh, Tony. And again, we really appreciate everyone tuning in, dealing with the technical difficulties. All your likes, shares, and comments, always much appreciated. Don't forget to subscribe to our YouTube channel, El Oso Fumar. This was our 63rd take uh, live from Euless, Texas. I'm your host, Barry Duplissy, as always. Don't forget to subscribe and download and leave a review on iTunes and Google Play as well. We are available for your drive time pleasure as well. I got to come up with a different tagline, but I'm rolling with it anyway. Like I said, I really appreciate everything. I want to thank Tony one more time from LaFleur Dominicana. Mr. Tony Gomez was my guest tonight. This was our 63rd take. And as always, guess what? We'll see you next time.